So uh, this morning we're joined by uh, 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 Brigadier General uh, Saleh Bala of Nigeria. Very welcome to National Defense University. Uh, the, the general is here uh, on an NDU reunion, so we're very lucky to have, uh, uh, to have caught you. And uh, thank you very much for, for giving us your time. Thank you for finding me worthy to speak. Absolutely, absolutely. So we wanted to find out, uh, just catching up with you, um, in your experience, you know, you're a graduate uh, of the uh, National War College with a distinguished uh, military career in Nigeria as a Chief of Staff of the Nigerian Army Infantry Center, as well as Chief of Staff in the UN operations in Ivory Coast. This is a long and uh, deep experience. Um, what can you tell us about where the continent is in terms of increasing the quality of professionalism of our senior officers, as well as uh, rising uh, officers in African militaries? Thank you very much. Uh, I'll quickly jump at this question by speaking in two terms. That uh, when it speaks to military professionalism uh, in, uh, in, the, in, in the areas of training, I think uh, African military officers are as well trained as any officer in the officer corps of most part of the advanced world. Uh, because an average uh, African officer would have done the junior command course, the senior command course, and of course uh, the strategic level war course, which I am privileged to uh, have attended. As you would know, the history of engagement, particularly of Nigeria, if I will speak to it, with the National Defense University as well as uh, institutions of higher military training in the United States, dates back way into, into from the 50s. So it is not to say we have a dearth of uh, professional capacity uh, amongst, the of, in the, amongst the officer corps. What may not be at the level of training could be for our enlisted. That is where the core issues are. Because only a few countries, without naming them, actually have focused local training institutions to train their NCOs to be as good as the NCOs from other parts, from the West particularly, if uh, one would say that is the standard. Now, uh, as you were talking to your your fellow alumni and your colleagues uh, out here at NDU, you spent some time uh, looking at uh, the problem of mismatching security sector resources with security threats. And this is a problem that creates corruption in the security sector. Can you elaborate on this, uh, specifically looking at how it threatens uh, the effectiveness of uh, security institutions? Yeah, there are, many, there are so many factors that uh, cause this problem. But you know, also the kind of education, or, 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 or for a lack of better word, the kind of indoctrination which the officer corps gets out of the training, sophisticated high-level training that we get from countries like this, we tend to situate the, the solutions to our kinds of low-level conflicts to the kinds of uh, high-level equipment which armies of the advanced world uh, armed forces of the advanced world uh, uses. Um, so this is one, the mindset, that uh, we tend to want to procure jets, artillery guns, sensors, drones, which we could do our war fighting without. And this comes at uh, huge costs and not in sync with the kind of procurement plan, the long-term procurement plan which uh, countries, nations, advanced nations like this uh, uh, get to have. Because it's, um, uh, uh, the defense industry is a huge complex, which involves the various sectors of the society, from research and development, to the industrial, to uh, the armed forces doctrine complex, that actually pro produce the products which translates into the kind of uh, uh, weapon systems that will be delivered. But in our own case, mostly our circumstances are contractor driven. We have a problem, a contractor comes in and tells you this is the equipment you need. And that lies in sync with the kind of indoctrination that you have from wherever country that you've been trained. 
If you have a, a, a group of pilots that were trained in the United States, their mentality right from junior officer rank, from the flight lieutenant rank, is to fly the kind of jets which they were trained upon in the various uh, high-speed military uh, uh, air force bases in the United States. It doesn't follow such. So um, this is one side of it, that procurement is not uh, a product of a doctrinal process in which the threat is analyzed and matched with the required equipment or arm to prosecute the effort. But speaking about corruption, if I would uh, jump into that, um, the military is a subsist system of the larger society. And soldiers, including me, are human beings. And at the end, we go back to our societies. And in African societies, as well as you know, uh, you attain a position by which some matching material achievements would accrue to you. So the culture of signifying your arrival at a professional level is how much you are able to match with acquisition. Um, corruption in the military is not done in isolation. It involves the politicians and the technocrats who are civilians. So it's a whole complex issue to, to speak about. But I always argue on the side of ethics that, a that the military is a very serious profession. It is a regimented profession, which at the average for an officer, you are inducted into at a very youthful age, probably at the age of 18. So it is expected that when you attain the rank of general or any serious senior level, you really would have been well grounded in what is appropriate and what is correct. And that the military life itself is very strict and very prudent. But uh, the disconnect is also the, by the fact that as you come to the tail end of your profession, you know that you are leaving the sanctity and security of the barracks and you are going back to the society and you have to match up with your, politi with your politician classmate or age group mate or the technocrat who is as well corrupt. So these are the push factors for military officers to be corrupt. And of course, the retirement packages are very, very poor. They are very, very poor. You retire into service and uh, probably you t retire out of service and probably your, your monthly income is about $30, $40. So that says something. Yes. Now, uh, sir, I, I was wondering if I could take you back to the, uh, you know, resource mismatch, you know, mismatch of resources. Yes. Given that situation, and given what you've just talked about yes. uh, with uh, the problem of corruption, yes. how should African countries, African militaries, uh, craft their partnerships with uh, foreign uh, countries? Because after all, uh, the procurement uh, of this equipment, this equipment is coming from, uh, uh, from overseas, from, from foreign partners. How should these partnerships be crafted in your experience? Um, my submission to this more or less is uh, that um, because of the situation we found ourselves, uh, that we need for our own foreign partners to be true to themselves. And uh, just like the experience Nigeria had only recently, that um, during, the, during the, the late years of uh, the Bush regime into the Obama regime, that we requested for some American aircraft, which we did not need which we could not maintain. But thank God for the, uh, uh, for the American parliament. Otherwise, what, what, was it, what is it called? Congress. The, Congress. Thank God for the Congress. Yes. They insisted that we cannot have that equipment. It's rather for another reason, but it was, it's a blessing. You know, it's the Leahy principle, and it was based on, on, on issues of, uh, of, of uh, of human rights and, uh, and the certain issues of uh, humanitarian law, which uh, military officers were said to have abused. But then it worked out because 
how do we procure this equipment and maintain them while actually we are fighting a counterinsurgency to which we do not need high speed and sophisticated machines like otherwise the Air Force were, were asking for. So I think what should be compelling is from the supply side. But then these nations have to do business. But I still would insist that the supply side should emphasize that you can only have equipment that you need and equipment that you can afford and maintain. Because otherwise the outcome of the failure goes back to the Western countries. Like today in my lecture, I, in a lighter mood, I told my audience that Europe particularly needs to rise to responsibilities in supporting ethics and morality to counter corruption in Africa. Otherwise, with protraction of conflicts, the refugee crisis in Africa will be exacerbated and more Africans will have to swim across the Mediterranean into Europe. So it is, it is a give, uh, life is a two-way street. Yes. Thank you for the time uh, that you've uh, been able to spend with us. Thank you very much. Yeah, the Africa Center for Strategic Studies is my second life commitment aside my service to my own country. Thank you very much for the privilege. You're very welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Very welcome.